Okay, so, thanks Alan uh, for the introduction. So uh, today my topic is King Lab iOS jailbreak internals. The user land read only memory can be dangerous. So as many of you noticed that uh, King Lab demonstrated iOS 10.3.2 and uh, 11 beta 2 jailbreak at MOSSEC 2017. But the details of the vulnerability has never been revealed yet. So today I would like to take this opportunity to show uh, the details of all uh, jailbreak uh, chains uh, which the bug is involved. So uh, first, about myself, uh, I'm the security researcher and also the team leader at Tencent uh, King Security Lab. And uh, previously, my uh, research covers on the browser uh, vulnerability research, uh, the exploitation, uh, majorly on the Safari, Chrome, and the uh, uh, Internet Explorer. And now my focus uh, moved to the Apple uh, vulnerability research, mainly for the sand sandbox bypassing and also kernel uh, privilege es escalation. So uh, today our uh, uh, agenda is like, we will firstly talk about the memory protection implemented by the modern OS. This is not a very impo uh, interesting uh, topic because it is there for many years. Next, we discuss about the iOS DMA features, including uh, the previous research, as well as the implementation of the iOS uh, M IOMMU protection. And the next, uh, because King Lab did a lot of reversing work on the iOS GPU notification uh, mechanism uh, part, since it is not an uh, um, open sourced part of the iOS kernel. And uh, with enough uh, knowledge explained, we will finally talk about the bug, uh, which includes two of them. Uh, the first one is in the DMA mapping uh, feature vulnerability, and another is the uh, out of bound write in the uh, Apple uh, graphics stack. After the vulnerability has been uh, explained, we will talk about the exploitation with the demo, and then we will con conclude this talk. So the first part is uh, operating uh, system uh, memory protection overview. So modern OS actually implements the memory protection at the hardware level to mitigate the known attack, uh, attacks. They are introduced in different levels. For example, the translation block entry properties at the MMU level. So uh, in this part, we will, uh, they introduce the NX, the non-executable bit and also the PXN to prevent uh, execution in the user land from the kernel side. And also the AP, which indicates uh, uh, access pro protection, uh, like the read only or write only or execute only memory. And uh, be uh, besides that, there are also some of the mitigations like the KPP AMCC, which is also uh, relating to the memory protection, but they are implemented in maybe uh, deeper and uh, lower level. Uh, which is not our uh, scope of the talk. So among those memory protection mechanisms, user land uh, read-only mapping is a very old school approach to protect the user land memory. It is very easily implemented, but very effective. There are three uh, major scenario of using such read-only uh, user land memory mappings. The first one is, for example, the executable memory in uh, iOS is only read-only to prevent uh, the attackers from overwriting uh, the code at the very early stage of the exploitation. And along with some other mitigations like the code signing uh, enforcement, this has made the iOS very strong in security. And the second scenario is the sharing memory. Uh, the first is the, the second one is uh, between process. For example, two processes share one physical copy of the memory. And the, in, the second, uh, in the third scenario, uh, it is the sharing memory between the kernel and the process. Memory sharing at user land makes the inter-process or user-to-kernel communication more efficient. This is because you do not need to use the traditional message send mechanism, like the, uh, to call some syscall or to call some uh, trap to uh, send the buffer from the user to the kernel. And uh, uh, in that way, the server process or the kernel who owns that memory 
can trust the uh, can trust it because he is the only one who can modify it. While the client side or uh, the client process can only have the read only process, uh, which uh, it is not possible to uh, change the memory. Then uh, the owner uh, process or the, or the kernel can eliminate the, the specific secret consideration such as the uh, boundary check or the time of check or time of use issues. So uh, its implementation at the MMU level is quite easy. It has in the TBE entry, it uh, introduced the access protection bit where you can find uh, the, uh, the specification document uh, on the right side. I will not look into it very detailedly. And when there is uh, a way found to make the mapping writable, then the whole uh, trust boundary of the uh, memory will be broken. But uh, uh, you need to make sure that the memory is remapped into uh, writable without marking the uh, copy on write. Otherwise, uh, another copy of the physical memory will be introduced and you are not able to uh, mutate the original physical copy of the mapping still. And uh, once that is done, then it can lead to privilege escalation. So in uh, the process to process memory sharing scenario, uh, you can lead to, uh, it can lead to sandbox bypass. While for the per process to kernel memory sharing uh, scenario, when you are able to uh, modify a read only mapping, it is very possible for you to get a kernel code execution. iOS actually has its nature to prevent such uh, writable remappings at its kernel code. You can see that uh, once uh, memory is mapped uh, to uh, to the uh, to the process using read only, actually it has that mapping has a property called max protection, and that max protection is set no uh, no higher than writable, so that uh, when you try to remap it as a read and write, the kernel will reject you immediately. But there is an exception. When uh, you, you specify a copy on write uh, protection uh, properties, it will, uh, the remapping will be allowed, but uh, another copy of the physical memory will be used, so you are still not able to modify that uh, original uh, memory. And of course, there is some historical issues. Uh, for example, the first one referred to the uh, enjoyed uh, shared memory uh, making it writable and cause some uh, issues. And the second one is for on Windows platform. However, you will be noticed that uh, on iOS platform, there is no such known issues. So we have to research uh, on our own. The next part will cover uh, the iOS DMA features. Because the, uh, the uh, the uh, more uh, stronger and uh, stronger and uh, more abundant features provided by modern peripheral uh, devices attached to the mod mobile device, DMA technology is introduced to enable the ability for faster data transfer. And uh, interestingly, the DMA transfer will not involve any CPU, so that the access permission bits on the virtual uh, addresses will be simply ignored. And uh, the next question is, does the DMA uh, tra transfer use the physical address? And uh, no, uh, if that is the case, uh, no me memory protection is involved anymore. But uh, definitely uh, it is not the case. Uh, why? Because modern phones are First reason is that modern phones are 64-bit, while many of their peripheral uh, devices remain 32-bit. In that case, uh, address translation is quite needed to trans translate uh, from 64-bit memory to 32-bit memory. And uh, another reason is that we have to enforce the memory protection for the DMA transfer also because if it is not there, it is not safe, right? The, because of this, the IOMMU is introduced to perform this job. IOMMU uh, on the 36, uh, 66-bit iOS device, uh, the concept dot 
which refers to a uh, device address resolution table is actually uh, introduced and responsible to perform such address translation. And there are two uh, kind of DMA, one for host to device DMA and another for uh, device to host DMA. For host to device DMA, actually the system physical memory is mapped into the IO space visible by the device. And in device to host DMA, it actually maps the device memory back to the OS virtual memory so that it can be identified by the operating system. And in the middle, uh, 2017, uh, Gao from Google Project Zero leverages the DMA features on iOS to achieve the firmware to host attack. And uh, he compromised uh, the, I, uh, the Wi Fi stack first and then try to mutate uh, some writable DMA mapping in the device memory, and uh, it is also shared to the OS uh, kernel memory. Uh, and uh, the OS, the iOS, thinks that uh, the, uh, the DMA on the, on, on the device is trustable. So uh, it uh, uh, eliminates a uh, necessary boundary check. And finally, with uh, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi stack compromised, it is very easy to, uh, to modify that memory and finally uh, to lead to kernel code execution. However, such attack uh, has some limitations. One obvious uh, uh, limitate, limitation is that such attack can only be performed in a short distance scenario because you have to compromise the Wi-Fi stack first. And uh, that requires the attacker and the victim in the same uh, Wi-Fi environment. Is it possible for us to make it long distance? For example, we have a browser exploit. We can uh, try to launch it remotely by the browser uh, exploit and uh, together with a kernel privilege escalation bug. And of course, by uh, utilizing uh, the DMA related bugs. And uh, that looks like a very crazy idea because the DMA features are kind of very low level implementation, which is mostly performed as at the kernel level or the device level. It is not exposed to the uh, user land directly for sure. And it is, it is still possible uh, to uh, think of it because there might be some indirect user land DMA on the iOS, for example, it, on the iOS system, it has some uh, uh, JPEG engine. Uh, it, it is responsible to, uh, to accelerate the, the de encoding and the decoding process. And also in another scenario, uh, there is uh, IO surface transform. It, and uh, actually it is uh, done by the hardware device called the scalar device. And we will uh, look into the iOS transform feature a little bit. And uh, we st actually, KingLab spent some time to investigate the iOS, uh, IO surface uh, transform feature. And uh, before we study it, I'd like to briefly introduce the IO surface and the IO surface accelerator framework. So, so on the Apple world, uh, the IO surface represents a user land buffer, which is shared with the kernel. And the user land applications can create a user uh, 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 I/O service by providing a existing user land buffer address and its length. So the code uh, on the right side shows the creation process. So it first gets the uh, properties of that user land memory and then create a uh, uh, I/O uh, memory descriptor with the specific uh, property uh, as options. So here, if option K I/O direction out is set, it indicates that the user land mapping is read only. And uh, once the read only mapping is uh, read write, then option K I/O uh, direction out as well as K I/O direction in will be both set. And the second framework is the IO surface accelerator. 
and it's a kind of a user land framework for, uh, and uh, it is only existing in uh, iOS platform. And there are two important uh, interfaces. One is IO Surface Accelerator Create, and another is IO Surface Accelerator Transfer uh, Surface. The first one uh, is responsible for creating a IO Kit user client connection representing a IO Surface uh, Accelerator client kernel object. And the second uh, interface uh, will uh, takes two I.O. surface handles, one for the source I.O. surface and the other for the destination and the do the transform. And there is one typical uh, scenario of using this framework, which is the screen snapshot, where you uh, have your destination I.O. Sur surface as a uh, receiving buffer and uh, the system maintains the uh, I.O. surface for the frame buffer, and uh, you make this transfer, and uh, you can get a screenshot of it, of your current iPhone screen. And uh, here is the low-level implementation of the I.O. surface accelerator. So uh, on the top side, you can see there is a, a object called I.O. Uh, surface accelerator client. Sorry. And uh, the next component is the Apple M2 Scalar CSC, which is an upper level driver, and it talks to the whole, uh, which stands for hardware abstraction, uh, abstract level. And the latter handles the device independent, uh, dependent stuff, and provides the device independent uh, interface to the driver. And uh, this uh, whole, whole device, uh, whole object also creates five important objects which stand for some important registers for that device. And uh, that uh, object whole also maps uh, device memory uh, from the device uh, IO space into the kernel virtual space via DMA represents the, uh, the device key registers. So here is uh, uh, the overall workflow for the uh, transform. The first is uh, the kernel will validate the parameter uh, from the user, side, uh, user land, and then it obtains the source and the destination I.O. surface address, and then it map the iOS, uh, I.O. surface buffer via DMA, and uh, then it obtains the mapped address and uh, set some buffer, uh, the device buffer, and then it starts the scalar device. And after the scalar device is started, then the kernel waits for the interrupt from the device to uh, wait for its completeness. And after it is complete, everything is finished. So we are mostly uh, interested on the DMA mapping part, and we are not interested in the other part. So this is actually done by the function set map uh, prepared memory uh, descriptor. And in that function code, you can see that uh, a kernel object called IODMA command created, created with a very special IO mapper. And actually, uh, that mapper is an instance of IO dart mapper, which is independent between devices to make sure that uh, device and the device are separated in, uh, separately in I.O. space addresses so that one cannot interfere another. And uh, using a very basic uh, I.O.S. utility called I.O. rec, you can find uh, this instance, the, the mapper instance for the dart scaler. And uh, then the IO uh, surface memory uh, descriptor will be bounded to the uh, IO DMA command. And the next step is to obtain the mapped uh, IO surface address in the IO space. This is done by the, uh, calling the function uh, uh, generate IO VM segments. After you call this um, function, you obtain that address and uh, you can no notice that V33 uh, indicates the result address, which is in 32-bit. And after you get the source and the destination IOS, uh, IO surface address in IO space, it's time to set the scalar device uh, 
register. The key uh, register is for source de uh, destination config control. This object is used to specify uh, those addresses. And uh, once you decide those addresses, you ch just change the, uh, uh, you, you specify it via uh, giving some res uh, value uh, and set it into some uh, specific offset in that uh, mapped uh, virtual memory. And after that, uh, this is done. And the final thing is to start the scaler. This is very easy. You just uh, need to uh, set one, which uh, indicates the power on uh, option uh, at the offset one to eight. And uh, after you make that value to one, the scalar device starts its working. Uh, it uh, starts its work immediately. And the final thing is for the kernel to wait for that device to finish working and uh, issue uh, interrupt event. Uh, to indicate this has been done. Okay, so the next part I will cover for the IOMMU memory protection. So uh, similar as the system MMU page table, the IOMMU also need to have the page table uh, specification. However, unlike the CV, uh, CPU MMU, the page table uh, document uh, for IOMMU is not there. So you have to uh, reverse the iOS start code to find out uh, the specification. And we did it uh, also. And uh, coincidentally, uh, Gao from uh, Project Zero, uh, Google Project Zero, also uh, he did a similar work. And here I just uh, post a picture uh, written by him uh, on the right side. You can see that it has very similar uh, specification as uh, CPU MMU. However, in his blog, he didn't mention that whether uh, the IOMMU uh, IO supports the memory protection or not. So here is a piece of his uh, blog. He said it is unknown whether it, is, uh, it can facilitate uh, the user uh, the read-only mappings. However, actually by reversing uh, the code in iOS uh, 11, we can get the answer. So IOVM map memory function is the entry uh, point for mapping the memory in uh, I.O. space, among wi uh, which the map options parameter here uh, has included the memory's protection bits in the virtual space. So here, the last three bits in that map options is translated to a direction value uh, visible by the IOMMU. So here, for read-only mappings, it has the direction value two, and the write-only mapping has the value one, and the read and the write mapping has the value three. We only need to uh, remember this. And this variable finally reached the uh, lower level implementation dot, and uh, a function called the set translation is finally reached. And uh, from the code logic uh, here, we can uh, clearly see that Actually, the eight and the nice bit in the TTE entry are AP-related bits. So finally, we got the access uh, pr uh, protection specification in TTE for IOMMU on iOS. So uh, here, the red part is uh, AP bits, and the zero zero stand for read and write, zero one read only, and the one zero write only. Next, we talk about the GPU notification mechanism. And on I, uh, iPhone 7 device, we found that Apple Pro Graphics provides with 128 channels for concurrent processing. Those channels are, have three categories, CL channel, GL channel, and the TA channel. And the kernel wraps join instructions from user land and put them into those channels. And then kernel just wait for the GPU to finish processing. Because of that, a well-designed notification mechanism is very necessary because uh, it needs to support for such high, uh, high need for concurrent processing. Here is a, a brief, brief uh, architecture uh, of the notification. The GPU task actually owns a stamp array representing a stamp status of each channel. 
So this memory is actually a representation of the UINT32 array of 128 elements, each showing the last complete instructions stamp of that channel. And this stamp array memory is actually mapped not only to the kernel, but also to the user land. And of course, the user land mapping is read only. And the kernel also maintains an array called the stamp address array. And this array is very simply uh, constructed by the uh, code uh, in below. And uh, it, uh, it, it contains an address array of 128 elements. And each element represents the virtual address of that mapped uh, stamp status kernel address. And the uh, stamp value of each channel is incremental upon each of the instruction processing completeness, which means once the uh, processing is uh, completed, then uh, the GPU will update that stamp value, uh, uh, add it uh, by one. And uh, in the kernel uh, side, there is also a object called IOXL event, which represents uh, the expected stamp value in specific channel of one or one group of join instructions. So one uh, axial event, IO axial event, contains eight sub-events. And one sub-event is eight bytes in size, where its lower uh, four bytes represents the channel index, and uh, the higher four bytes represents the expected uh, spent stamp value of that join instruction. So to test whether a, a, a join instruction has been completed or not, you just need to uh, compare the ex expect stamp value with the value in that stamp array. So here is the code. It checks whether expect stamp is higher than the uh, current uh, last completed instruction. Uh, uh, stamp value. If it is higher, then it uh, continues uh, the waiting uh, process in the loop. In, in the loop. But uh, if it is smaller or equal, it means that uh, join instruction has already been finished. Last but not the least, to improve the performance, the I, some of the IO axial event objects are also mapped into the user land which is highly related to our bug. This is to make sure that the user land applications can understand the status of the current, uh, current uh, instruction and the current event without asking the kernel. So the, the user land app can also test whether the event ha has been completed or not. Okay, now with uh, almost all the concepts well explained, Let's discuss about the real uh, vulnerabilities. So the first vulnerability is quite uh, simple and uh, obvious. On the iOS uh, 10 and the early beta of iOS 11, actually the map options of the virtual memory is simply ignored by the Dart mapper. So from the uh, code be uh, below, you can see that in the uh, Dart code IOVM alloc, there is an option uh, called the map options, which indicates uh, mm, access protection bits of the virtual memory. And this parameter is never used later in that function. And in the lower level implementation, when uh, uh, the set translation API is called, you can find that the 8th byte and the 8th uh, bit and the 9th bit of the TTE are both set to zero which indicates uh, from our previous research, zero, zero means uh, read and write. It means for any kind of uh, user land mappings or kernel land, land mappings, once it is uh, translated and mapped into the I.O. space, it is always read and write. And the second uh, is the out-of-bound write vulnerability. 
So before I talk about it, I will explain the concept of the IO axial resource object. Actually, IO axial resource object is very similar in fun functionality as the IO surface object, except that the uh, IO axial resource represents a shared user land buffer which would be mapped into the GPU task. And like the IOS, uh, IO surface object, we can also create the IO, uh, IO axial resource object uh, by specifying an uh, existing user land buffer uh, in the user land applications. And uh, during the uh, initialization process, a shared mapping will be created. This shared mapping is called IO axial client shared IO. And uh, this uh, object contains uh, IO axial event array with four elements with uh, the resource ID and its type information. And uh, this object, the whole object is mapped into both user land and the kernel. And of course, the user land mapping is read only. And uh, this address will also be returned to the user land applications so the user uh, will know the address of it. And the user, uh, uh, user application can also delete the created IO axial resource by calling the method one in uh, IO axial shared user client. And uh, after that, the test event function will be reached. And this function uh, actually uh, simply checks which, uh, if each uh, IO axial event object in IO axial client shared RO is complete or not. The code logic is quite simple. So first it checks whether the event's expect uh, stamp value is lower than the current uh, stamp maintained in an object called M inline array. And if yes, then it means the event has been completed. Yeah, and uh, if not, then uh, the code try to fetch the latest stamp value uh, from the device memory, which is referred to by uh, the array uh, m stamp uh, address array. And uh, after the latest uh, value has been obtained, it do the comparison again. It do the comparison again and check uh, if it is smaller or bigger and uh, decide whether this, uh, this uh, event has been completed or not. It looks very uh, good at uh, first glance. However, together with the DMA mapping bug, the, it is possible that we can, uh, we can modify uh, the, the uh, channel index here. And because uh, this, uh, this object is created by kernel and it's not possible uh, to be mutated by the user land applications, kernel fully trusts it and it doesn't perform enough boundary check. So once the uh, index is mutated to a very big value, then of course we will have a out of bound read to read out the array of the M stamp array, address array. And uh, read out the, that uh, value and then write to the uh, M inline array, which is uh, OB write. Okay, so after the box has been uh, explained, let's look into the exploitation. So exploitability of those two bugs depends on whether we can control the content for both M inline array and the M stamp address array. We need to control the content of both of them. It looks like a very hard task. This is because that both arrays are created in very early stage of the iOS booting process. And it looks impossible that we can put very controlled contents right after them. And also the second reason is that the size of the element of each array is quite different. The larger the index we specify, the longer span in the, dis, uh, the, the address of the reference array element we have. So th that's uh, not a very good news. And to exploit this bug, the memory layouting is a key factor. Before doing that, we need to understand some facts. The first fact is that kernel heap memory starts 
uh, at a relatively low address. And the heap can grow, uh, grow uh, linearly uh, with more and more memory uh, allocated. And the start address of the heap differs within tens of megabytes upon each boot. This is due to the early va random value. And uh, also the address of M inline array and the M stamp address array are closed with each other. And because of that, uh, we can uh, use a relatively large channel index along with some uh, technologies like uh, kernel heap spray. We might able to increase the possibility to make sure the out of bound value uh, of both array are under our control. So uh, we definitely need a heap spray technologies and luckily, this is not a problem because it is well published and uh, you can find a lot of public articles about it. And on iPhone 7, uh, under our test, we can spray around 350 megabytes kernel memory within the container sandbox applications. And after those two uh, arrays are created, there are around 50 megabytes extra kernel memory allocated. So what conclusion we can get at this stage? The first, the, because uh, the M inline array element size is 24 bytes, and the M uh, stamp address array element size is eight bytes. So uh, if we can make sure that the index value multiplied by 24, is smaller than 400 megabytes, and the index value multiplied by eight is larger than 50 megabytes. Then we, uh, we get the range of index is in this, this range. And if the index is in this range, we will have higher po probabilities and higher possibilities that both out of bound value of both array are fallen into our spread data. And the uh, next issue is, do we have uh, arbitrary memory read and write? According to the nature of the bug, the arbitrary memory read is not a problem because M uh, stamp address array element size is eight byte. With arbitrary uh, index value, you can reach every D words within each page. However, the higher four bytes of a Q word cannot be read, but it is not necessary because we, uh, in usually uh, to make it code execution, you only need to modify an address lower bytes, lower four bytes instead of the higher four bytes. However, the arbitrary memory write is more tricky because uh, the, uh, b because, uh, because the M inline array uh, element size is 24 bytes, only one of its D word can be written. So it introduced a very interesting issue. Can we OOB write to an arbitrary offset in a 0x4000 page with the OOB array element size only 24 bytes? Before we solve this issue, we need to understand some facts. The, facts, the first fact is a good news thanks to the mechanism of the iOS XNU zone allocator. The base address of M inline array is always at offset 0xF0 or 0x20F0 yeah, because it is a, a, a field in some uh, bigger object which is uh, one, uh, 4, 000 in, in uh, 2,000 page, uh, 2,000 in size, 0x2,000 in size. And uh, similarly, M stamp address array is allocated with uh, 0x200 in size, falling into the calloc.512 zone. And uh, this address offset within the 0x uh, 4,000 page can all be the value, uh, can all, can be all values dividable by 0x200. So this is a uh, good news. And uh, similarly, uh, uh, we, we need to find a, 
find a way to write arbitrary page offset by OB write on the M inline array. And this problem uh, can be solved actually by, by uh, a mathematics theory called the congruence theory. So because 0x c000 is dividable by 0x4000, so all index values where the remainder values divided by 0x800 are the same. So we can always uh, all be right to the same offset in the m inline array. And with in the fact here, we get, get the conclu conclusion that uh, given uh, the index equals to uh, 0x q7f6 uh, plus n multiplied by 0x800. So uh, if that uh, condition is meet, we, we can always overwrite to the first eight bytes in a spread page. And uh, uh, the next problem is to reach the arbitrary offset within the page, we think uh, with the M be the offset of the page, we just ensure that index equals to this. And uh, we can reach to arbitrary uh, um, uh, offset within the page. So we resolve this problem. So here, uh, you don't need to understand uh, all the stories of the concurrence uh, theory, but you only need to remember the uh, result, the conclusion. So when index equals to this, and uh, it's within the range of this, then uh, we can, uh, we are able to, uh, to uh, overwrite arbitrary offset in a page. And at last, we choose the value 0x9e6185, which means it can uh, reach the offset 568 of uh, one, uh, 4,000 page by writing uh, this M inline array out of bound. And uh, now let's do the first attempt uh, of exploitation. First, uh, we uh, try to uh, explore, uh, spray uh, around uh, 350 megabytes. And uh, the logic is here. The test event function will reach the OB values uh, uh, here, here. And uh, then it uh, try to, uh, try to, uh, tr try to put a guest address onto it and uh, refer to the value of it in slot B. We call it uh, the value uh, re written, uh, read, what value to read. And uh, the uh, value uh, that is read will be finally uh, written to uh, the slot C at the offset 0x568, which is uh, M uh, in line array, uh, in, in uh, M in line array, uh, array. And uh, by first uh, attempt of the exploit, we then receive the uh, OL message to see which message AW field, the uh, address written field, has been changed. By checking the new value in that uh, address, we can obtain two very important pieces of information. The first information is which OL message is allocated in uh, slot C. And the second message, uh, important uh, information is which OL message is in slot B, because we can specify each OL message's VR field very unique. And oft, after we got those information, we can perform the second exploit to bypass the ASLR. We do it by filling uh, slot B with uh, HXGL uh, context object. And that object is in calloc.8192. So it's very good. You can fill, uh, free the slot B and fill in the, at the same address. And then we change the GA value to this which is the origin GA value uh, minus 0x30. Because the base address of slot B is the V table of the first eight bytes of the object is the V table address of HXGL context object. So we exploit the bug again, and finally we got the lower four bytes of the HXGL context V table. 
And after that, uh, we obtain the, uh, we bypass the KSLR. And uh, finally, we, we need the code execution. So to get the code execution, we need to free the slot C and uh, fill in with the object where it's uh, offset 0x568 represents some important object. And we found the HXGL context is the best choice also because it's uh, offset 568 represents a uh, HX accelerator object. By calling uh, that user client's method zero, we can reach the function context finish. And the context finish will give reference uh, that object's 568 uh, as a D keyword as a uh, HX accelerator object and use it to call its virtual uh, functions. So by uh, exploit that bug again, we are able to uh, modify the lower four bytes of that HX ac accelerator object and uh, to modify the to any arbitrary value and uh, we can control the content of that uh, new address so that we get PC control. So finally, uh, I talk about the overall exploit overflow. So first we create an IOXL resource and then we got the IOXL event read only buffer. We trigger the first bug to modify the M channel index to a bigger value. And then we tri uh, prepare the memory layout trigger bug two to obtain the index of the slot B and the slot C. And then we uh, prepare the memory layout and uh, uh, to, uh, to for KASL by bypass, trigger the bug two and obtain the V table of HXGL context so that we bypass KSLR. And uh, finally, we prepare the memory layout again for K code execution to trigger bug two again and overwrite the HX accelerator um, pointer in HXGL context. And after that, we can perform a ROP and get the task for PID zero, and then we perform post exploitation to jailbreak. So uh, after that, we got the task for PID zero, but it's the only first step of the jailbreak. We still need to break the AMFI to uh, remount the root FS to uh, read and write, and to perform the KPP and AMCC bypass, etc. And uh, those are very well documented out outside uh, publicly, and it's not a scope of our talk. And uh, we we will show a demo of the attack. Yeah, so uh, because of the time limitation, I will skip uh, some uh, parts. And the first, uh, we, we choose uh, version 10.3.3 .3 because I only have this version which can exploit this bug. Actually, uh, the bug also exists in some early version of iOS uh, 11 beta, but uh, I don't have the device. So uh, we click the, our application, uh, we bypass the sandbox. Uh, actually, there is no sandbox because we exploit the kernel directly, but uh, we involve two bugs. So one, I think maybe sometimes uh, it can also, uh, the DMA feature bug can also bypass the uh, sandbox uh, also. But here we don't use it. We just use it to uh, change the M index, channel index. Yeah, after we bypass the PP, uh, KPP, then uh, it uh, do a respring. And finally, uh, we found that uh, the, the CDR is installed on this machine uh, with, uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, but it's a little bit broken, but uh, I think with trivial uh, actions, you can make it work. Yeah, and finally, you can find the correct version of it. And uh, finally, uh, I talk about the conclusion. So uh, with the first release of iOS 11, Apple actually fixed the first bug, which is a DMA mapping bug. And uh, it is actually fixed by adding the implementation of the read-only mapping at its start code. And uh, however, the other OOB write bug remains unfixed up till now. And this is a very good example of, of how secret can be broken by very bad implementation but with very good hardware design. And it uh, makes uh, 
possible a very complex exploit chain to achieve the jailbreak within the user land applications. At this uh, stage, it is still safe to say that uh, because with the first bug fixed, the trust boundary of the user land read-only mapping is back, so you don't need to, uh, to fix the bug too. But it brings a problem to us. Should we actually trust the kernel, tr uh, uh, the user land read-only mappings? And of course, currently, there is no definite answer because I don't have another way to break that trust boundary. But at least in this talk, we demonstrated that the user land read-only mapping can be dangerous. It is possible that in the future, another bug is introduced and break this trust boundary, uh, trust boundary again. And we make the whole exploit chain work again. It's very likely. And we never know at this moment. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions. <laughs>